السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي الناس والله حي الناس والله حي الناس والله حي على الظلمة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا تقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد قال عبد الله بن عباس رضي الله تعالى عنهما قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم تركت فيكم أيها الناس ما اعتصمتم به فلن تضلوا بعد أبدا كتاب الله وسنة نبيه عبد الله بن عباس رضي الله رضي الله عنهما he said that the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said that I have O oh people I have left you with two things O oh people I have left you with two things if you hold on tightly to these two things you will never go astray after me you will never go astray after me and that is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sunnah of his prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Brothers and sisters in Islam, these two elements, these two sources represent the sirat al-mustaqim, the straight path that we have been asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep us guided upon in every single salat. Unfortunately, in today's time and perhaps after this khutbah, we're going to see how much of a walking contradiction many of us are. Because in every single salat, <coughs> in every single rakah, in every single salat, as a matter of fact, your salat would not be acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without this particular phrase which is mentioned in this particular surah, which is considered the greatest surah in the Qur'an, and that is surah al-Fatiha. Surah al-Fatiha. And within Surah Al-Fatiha, we say every single rakah, in every single salah, إِهْدِينَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Guide us to the straight path. 
and the straight path as Abdullah ibn Abbas and many other scholars from amongst the Sahaba have stated over and over again, the Sirat al-Mustaqim is the Sirat, the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So how do you make this dua in every single salat? asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide you to the straight path, then yet, soon as you make the taslim and you exit your prayer, your entire life is a contradiction of the sirat al-mustaqim. How, as a Muslim, is your entire life a contradiction to the very thing that you are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep you guided upon? And that is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Sirat al-Mustaqim, the straight path, it guarantees those who stick to it divine success in this life as well as in the hereafter. It is out of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he did not take the soul of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam until he established a clear path that would endure the test of time and stand against all forms of misguidance and deviance, that which is apparent and that which is not so apparent. Clear proof from your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala as Allah says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal nas, qad ja'akum burhanun min rabbikum wa anzalna ilaykum nuran mubina fa amma alladhina amanu billahi wa'tasamu bihi fa sayudkhiluhum fi rahmatin wa fadlin wa yahdihim ilayhi siratan mustaqima. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Nisa, Surah number four, Ya ayyuhal nas, O mankind, there has indeed come to you clear proofs from your Lord. And we have sent down to you a clear path. <coughs> we have sent down to you Nuran Mubina, a light that is clear, illuminating the path for you. And as for those who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa atasamu bihi, and they hold tightly to Allah. Hold tightly to Allah. Because al i'tisam, as the scholars they explain, Holding fast is holding fast to two things. Holding fast to Allah and holding fast to the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Two totally different things and inshallah ta'ala I will elaborate on that a little bit more tonight. My khutbah is not necessarily about that but I wanted to make an ishara. I wanted to point to that really quickly. That i'tisam, holding tightly, is holding tightly to Allah and holding tightly to the book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And what is the difference between the two? I'll elaborate that on more of that tonight when we break down the khutbah inshallah ta'ala. Because that's a class within itself. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاعْتَصِمُوا بِهِ Those who hold tightly to Allah, فَسُيُدْخِلُهُمْ فِي رَحْمَةٍ وَفَضْلٍ That Allah will put them into His mercy and to His grace. وَيَهْدِيهِمْ إِلَى سِرَاطٍ إِلَيْهِ سِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمًا And He will guide them to Himself by a straight path. Listen to the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَيَهْدِيهِمْ إِلَيْهِ سِرَاطًا مُسْتَقِيمًا And he will guide them to himself through a straight path. سِرَاطًا مُسْتَقِيمًا The Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned in another authentic hadith, تَرَقْتُكُمْ عَلَى مَحَجَّةِ الْبَيْضَى لَيْلُهَا كَنَهَارِهَا لَا يَزِيغُ عَنْهَا إِلَّا هَالِكْ The Prophet ﷺ said that I have left you upon a clear white path. لَيْلُهَا كَنَهَارِهَا Its night is as clear as its day. No one seeks to go to the opposite or to, to go around that path except that he will be destroyed. Meaning there is no way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala other than the path that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam put us upon. And in recent times, many Muslims are seeking a version of Islam that allows them to pursue their desires without accountability. By removing these two fundamental elements from our deen, that has guaranteed success for the Sahaba and guaranteed success for anyone who follows them. Imam Malik rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, highlighting the fact that there is no substitute for success, meaning if we are going to be successful as a Muslim ummah, as a Muslim nation, then we will do so by following the blueprint of the early Muslims and following the elements that led to their success. And there is no other path to success other than that. Imam Malik rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, لَنْ يُسْلِحُ آخِرَ هَذِهِ الْأُمَّ إِلَّا بِمَا أَصْلَحَ أَوَّلَهَا وَفِي رِوَايَةٍ قَالَ فَمَا لَمْ يَكُنْ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ دِينًا لَا يَكُنُ الْيَوْمْ دِينًا Imam Malik rahimahullah ta'ala, words that should have been written in gold. He said that nothing will repair 
or rectify the latter part of this ummah, except what repaired and rectified the former part of this ummah. Meaning, the former part of this ummah, meaning the Sahaba and the Tabi'un, the Atba'i the Tabi'in, the three fundamental, the three generations, three prominent generations after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What made them successful is the same thing that is going to make us successful. We can't think that we're going to create another version of Islam that is more palatable for our weakness and our mediocrity in today's time that is going to be better than the success that, that was guaranteed to the Sahaba. If we want the success that they had, then we have to follow the same path that they tread. He said, nothing will rectify the latter part of this ummah except by what rectified the former part of this ummah. And whatever is not a part of the deen that was part of the deen on that day that, that was the deen was given to them will never be a part of our deen today. It will never be a part of our deen today. And much of the disdain and the disregard that we are seeing with many Muslims today for whether for the Quran or for the Sunnah or for both of them is due to our disconnect from Islam. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he spoke to this time, he prophesied that this time would come, and here we are today in today's time, where people believe that certain things should be taken out of the Qur'an. Certain things don't have to be followed in the Qur'an because that was for that time and not for today's time. People rejecting the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam altogether because those are the words of the Prophet, I only follow the Qur'an. This is alive and, alive and well in our day and time today. And then you have those of us who reject both of the Qur'an and the Sunnah, maybe not in word, but in statement, because we don't practice it. We know it's from the deen. When someone comes to correct us and say, you know that's not from Islam. Yeah, 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 I know. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. <coughs> the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam listened to his words. He said, Yushiku rajulun shab'anun. the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, perhaps there's going to come a time. Yushiku. Perhaps there's going to come a time upon the Muslims where a man, Shaba'an, who will have a full stomach reclining on his couch. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the scholars say, the reason why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave this detailed description is because he's describing to us the laziness of the Muslims during that time. And while the Prophet Sallallahu said he's Shaba'an, he's uh, had a full stomach and he's sitting on his couch reclining. And today's time we sit back on a computer with food over here and we're sitting on a computer typing with food in our mouth, chewing, typing with food. Just the, 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 the audacity, the audacity. These are not people who are learned, who studied the religion, who spent years of their lives collecting and gathering information, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the last third of the night to give him fiqh of the deen. There was sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'een that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa made dua for them. Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhum, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa made dua for them. Dua for him. So much so that Abu Huraira said, I never forgot anything that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said. Nothing. Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, Abdullah ibn Abbas, radiallahu ta'ala anhum. Allahumma faqihu fi al-deen wa alimnuhu wa alimhu ta'wil. Oh Allah, give him a fiqh of the deen and teach him the interpretation of the Qur'an. And then lo and behold, Abdullah ibn Abbas becomes known as Mutarajim al-Qur'an or Tarajuman al-Qur'an, the interpreter of the Qur'an. These were individuals the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made dua for because he saw their studiousness. He saw their astuteness and their desire and their love for knowledge. While today we are completely turned off from knowledge of the religion, yet we'll go on the internet and we'll comment about this and comment about that with having no fiqh, no knowledge, no understanding of the deen whatsoever. This is the time that we live in. Yushiku rajalun shaba'anun muttaki'un ala arikatihi. Perhaps there will come a time where a man is full, his stomach is poking out, his stomach is protruding because he's full, shaba'an. And he's reclining on his couch. 
And he says to the people that are around him, Bainana wa bainakum kitabullah. The only legislation that we consider valid is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whatever we find in the Quran is halal, we'll consider halal. And whatever we consider in the Quran haram, we'll consider it haram. This is a contradiction. Because what this person is attempting to do is to dismiss the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We only follow what's in the Qur'an. Which is in fact a lie. Because if you follow the Qur'an, it's no different than what Christians say when they say we follow the Bible. Because if you follow the Bible, you would be Muslim. If you follow the Bible, you would be Muslim. Because nowhere in the Bible does Jesus say, I am God. But you don't read your book. You don't read it for guidance. You read it to assuage your own conscience, to make yourself feel better about the partying and the drinking and the sexting that you did the night before when you show up on church on Sunday. You're not reading for guidance. Because if you were truly a follower of the Bible, it would have led you to the Quran. Similarly with Muslims, if you were truly following the Qur'an, you would follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu So what they're attempting to do is to dismiss the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu They say whatever we find in the Qur'an halal, we're considered halal. Whatever we find in the Qur'an haram, we're considered haram, which is a lie. Which is a lie. It's an attempt, a feigned attempt to dismiss the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu the Prophet ended the hadith by saying, don't do this. He said, because indeed what the Messenger of Allah made haram is similar to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made haram. And in another narration, the Prophet sallallahu said, إِنَّمَا أُتِيتُ الْقُرْآنُ وَمِثْرُهُ مَعَهُ I have been given the Qur'an and that which is like it, meaning the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu this is for the nation of Islam. This is for the followers of War of Deen Muhammad. If you were truly followers of the Quran, you would be followers of the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made haram is no different than what Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala made haram. And so we see this today with many Muslims, unfortunately, who are quick to give an opinion about something in the religion, but have not invested any time or any energy in acquiring any substantial amount of knowledge about what they are speaking about. And all of this leads to a disregard for the two sources of knowledge in our deen, which is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And as the scholars say, anytime you find differing and division amongst the Muslims, you will find that they don't unite upon the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if everyone was following the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there would be no division amongst us. The division that exists amongst us is as a result of our distance from the true teachings of Islam. Has nothing to do with the differences of opinion. Scholars, past and present, have differed in many matters. In the matters of the deen that we are allowed to differ in. Thick issues. Secondary matters in the religion. Not the matters, not the usul. Not the fundamental, foundational matters of the religion. The issues of aqidah. The issues of fiqh. Scholars, past and present, have differed. But it never led to the division that we see today amongst Muslims. Our division is not a division as a result of knowledge. Our division is a of division as a result of ignorance. Scholars divide. Scholars, they had some problems with each other. As Imam Ahmed said about Ishaq ibn Rahway, one of his contemporaries, he said, Ishaq akhuna wa in yukhalifuna fi ashya. Ishaq is my brother, even though he differs with me in many matters of the religion. That's my brother. Many scholars would welcome Imam Shafi'i would welcome. He said, ma jadaltu aliman illa ghalabtuhu wa ma jadalani jahilun illa ghalabani. Imam Shafi said, I never argued with a man, never debated with a man who had knowledge, except that I conquered him in a debate. Can't hold, can't hold the candlestick to me. He said, but I never argued with a person who was ignorant, except he conquered me in the debate. Because I can't argue with you. You argue based on ignorance. How do I argue with, how do you argue with somebody who has no foundational knowledge of the doom? And then get mad when you correct them. And they get belligerent and indignant when you correct them. SubhanAllah al Ready to spill your blood. Because you're correcting them with the book of Allah, the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and you're, you're going to bask in your ignorance. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said the sign of a hypocrite is four. One of those signs is that when he argues, he becomes disrespectful. 
That's not a person of knowledge. People of knowledge all the time challenge one another. I welcome anybody to challenge me, to prove me that I'm saying something that is incorrect. Correct me. When Abu Bakr became the Khalifa, he got on the minbar, he gave a long khutbah. And at the end of the khutbah, he said that if I'm right, for in asabtu, for kawimuni, that if I'm right, then strengthen me. What in akhtatu, for for sawibuni, he said, and if I'm wrong, then correct me. If I'm right, don't go against me, don't oppose me. If I'm right, strengthen me, aid me, add to what I'm doing when you know that I'm right. And correct me when I'm wrong. It's literally that simple. But you have in today's time individuals that want to resort to name calling, resort to spilling blood simply because they don't agree with you. And that is a sign of people of innovation. I know that that may come as a surprise, you know, because we're used to hearing who's a deviant, who's an innovator from other people. But let me tell you something. The people of Sunnah, the people of Ilm, the people of knowledge, they never resort to calling people names or resort to spilling blood because the truth will set you free. You don't have to do that when you know that you're on the truth. You only have to resort to those type of tactics to defend and protect your ignorance. As one of the scholars say, that no one ever went to the extreme in their innovation, innovation except at the end of that road, it leads to spilling blood. No one has ever gone to the extreme in innovation except at the end of that road, it leads to spilling blood. Because you got to spill blood in order to defend your bid'ah. You got to spill blood in order to defend your innovation, to defend your ignorance. A person who has knowledge would never have to resort to that. Because the knowledge is their defense. The book of Allah, the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We are living in a time of much controversy and confusion that has consumed much of the Muslim community today. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also prophesied that that time would come. He said, إِنَّهُ مَيَّ عِشْ مِنْكُمْ بَعْدِي فَسَيَرَ اخْتِلَافٍ كَثِيرًا فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِالسُنَّةِ وَسُنَّةُ خُلَفَاءَ الرَّاشِدِينَ الْمَهْدِيِّينَ مِنْ بَعْدِي عَضُّوا عَلَيْهَا بِالنَّوَاجِفِ وَإِيَّاكُمْ وَمُحْدَثَاتُ الْأُمُورِ فَإِنَّ كُلَّ بِدْعَةٍ ضَلَالَةٍ The Prophet ﷺ said, Whoever from amongst you lives after me, you will see much controversy, much confusion amongst the ummah. He said, فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِالسُنَّةِ But he gave us the remedy to, um, to emerge and during that time of confusion and that time of fitna, as people who still hold on to the deen correctly, so hold fast to my sunnah. And the sunnah of the Khulafa al Rashidin, and the sunnah of the four rightly guided Khalifas that come after me. Bite onto it with your molar teeth. He said, and I caution you for newly invented matters in the religion, for every newly invented matter is a misguidance. And so we are living in a time of great fitna, great controversy, confusion. And subhanAllah, as the Prophet ﷺ prophesies at another time, that every time a fitna disappears, another one comes that is greater than it. And we have to keep that in mind. When you're living during a time of fitna, and you think that, man, I can't wait until this is over. Soon as that passes, you have to know that the next fitna that comes will be worse than the one that left. It only gets worse and worse and worse. It doesn't get any better. Which means that as a Muslim, if you know that, then that means that you have to get better as a Muslim in order to be able to survive the times. Because if you're only holding on to a thread of your deen during this time of fitna, then soon as that subsides, the next one comes, going to wipe you out. The next fitna comes, it's going to wipe you out. The Prophet Sallallahu said, Tamuju al fitan kamoj al bahar. That the fitna, trials, and tribulations will come one after another like the waves of the ocean. A wave washes up, and then it washes away, and then another wave comes. That's the way fitna comes. And so, knowledge, guarding yourself with knowledge, armoring yourself with knowledge is how you survive the times. And unfortunately, many Muslims are just bouncing all over the place because you have no foundation. You have no foundation. 
As Imam al-Shafi said, is it the case that every time somebody comes with an opinion that seems like it's more eloquent than my opinion, am I to leave the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet and follow your opinion? You sound good, great, but I'm not going to abandon what has guaranteed me success because you sound eloquent. And here we are today, soon as somebody emerges, came from Yemen, came from Egypt, came from wherever he came from. And he emerges with a microphone on social media and he sounds good. And it sounds like something I want to get behind. He's trending. We abandon the book of Allah, the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. our intellects right along with it and follow him. Years go by, you on this nonsense, and then you come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful enough to bring you back. And then you come around apologizing to everybody you wronged, mashallah, tabarakallah. And you could avoid it, all of that if you would have just held on to the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet And we repeat this cycle over and over and over again. No stability in our deen, no stability in our communities. Because every time somebody comes along that sounds eloquent, that sounds like he's, you know, makes sense, sounds like he's preaching directly to me, we leave the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet to follow it. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said la yati ala nasi zamanun illa walladhi ba'dahu sharrun minhu hatta talqa rabbukum The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that there does not come upon the people a time except that the time that comes after it is worse than it until you meet your lord This process will continue to happen over and over you look out and what you see happening what is going on in Gaza? What is going on in Palestine? What is happening around the universities around America? What is going on? This is great fitna. And it's only going to get worse. Only going to get worse. So where does that leave you as a Muslim in the midst of all of this? Maybe you live in a bubble and you don't have a clue what I'm talking about. And that's even worse. Ignorance is not bliss, I promise you. Ignorance leads to the hellfire. Ignorance is not bliss to say, well, that's them. I ain't got nothing to do with me and what's going on in my little bubble and my little life. Ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance leads to the hellfire. We have to be people of deep thought, people of forethought, people who don't just sit around and wait for something to happen, but people of leadership, ulul al-bab as Allah refers to them in the Quran, people of intellect, people of intelligence who sit back and think and ponder over the world and what is happening. It's part of our deen. And another hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا يكون عام لا يكون عام خير من عام ولا أمير خير من أمير ولكن ذهاب علماءكم وخياركم ثم يحدث أقواما يقيسون الأمور بآرائهم فيهدم الإسلام ويثلم. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that there is no year that will be better than another year. And there is no leader that will be better than another leader. Understand what he's saying here. No president is going to come right now in 2024 and undo everything Joe Biden did. The president that comes after, every president that comes will get worse and worse and worse. Understand what the Prophet is saying. We listen to politicians and they get us all hyped up but all of these false promises. That's exactly what the Dajjal designed to do. The word Dajjal means liar. What part of that don't we understand? Dajjal is a liar. He makes false promises. The, the, the Dajjal doesn't just emerge and say, I'm God, I'm here. No, he starts off as a normal person, righteous person, and he works his way up. Self-deluded. He starts to see himself as righteous. People accept him and notice him as righteous. Then he gets into politics. And then he works his way right up until he starts to claim that he's a prophet. And then after claiming he's a prophet, he claims that he's God. But the whole while, he's using what is externally acceptable to the people because the people, they don't think beyond what they see. And lo and behold, everyone worships him. But he starts off making false promises. The Prophet ﷺ said that the Dajjal will emerge with fire and water. And what you perceive as fire is actually water. And what you perceive as water is actually fire. 
But the average individual will not know that because we judge things based upon how we see them initially and we don't think beyond that. That's just what it is. No. You have to be a deep thinker to understand the system that is permeating right beneath our feet to pave the way for the emergence of the Dajjal. And if what I'm saying right now is over your head, then you need to go back and learn your deen. You need to learn Islam. If what I'm saying to you right now resonates with you and is some type of fear that you are, is, is instilling in you, then you need to armor up. You armor up with knowledge, with any knowledge of the deen. Do you think that I would have the level of confidence that I had without having learned something of the deen? This confidence doesn't come from arrogance. It comes from knowledge of the religion. And I'm not saying that I'm knowledgeable or I'm on sheikh status. No, but I have enough knowledge of the deen to know that everything that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying is playing out right in front of us. And I believe it wholeheartedly. This is not a joke to me. Deen is not a joke to me. It's not something that I do when it's convenient for me. This is what we should be doing every day of our lives. We eat, sleep, drink Islam. That's it. My whole entire life revolves around this deen and that's it. Make no compromises for, for that. I wouldn't care if they would put me in cuffs, taking me to book me. It's time for Salat. I need to pray. You got to hold on with that. It's time for Salat. I don't care where I am. My deen comes first. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes first. Deen can't be a joke, brothers and sisters. Otherwise, you're going to get swept away with everybody else, man. And your shahada will, will be, what, what will it be all for? What is it worth? If you take shahada and you don't do anything with it, what is it worth? But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that there is no year that would be better than the year after it. And there's no leader that will be better than the leader that comes after him. He said, but your scholars, the people of knowledge will disappear. And the people of khair and the people who just want to do good and service the community, even though they're not people of knowledge, will disappear. And then that type of environment will produce the type of people. That they will begin to judge the affairs based upon their own personal opinions. We're talking about within the Muslim community. And here we are today. I post something on social media. From the most ignorant of the Muslim community, jump on social media and comment on it. Matter of fact, you, you haven't even memorized Al-Fatiha properly. Yet you're on social media commenting on something that someone who has actually studied the religion has posted. That's where we're at. They will begin to judge the affairs of the deen based upon their own opinions. Islam, And they will destroy Islam, the traditions of Islam. They will destroy the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning the traditions and so the only way out of this obscurity and this confusion, brothers and sisters, is to stick to the Qur'an and the Sunnah and statement and action. And the path that guaranteed the success of the previous generations that came before us, the Prophet ﷺ said, The Prophet ﷺ said, the best of generations was my generation. The best of generations is my generation, meaning the Sahaba, those who lived during my time. That is the best of our ummah. There, it gets no better than that. The golden age of Islam is when the Prophet ﷺ was around the Sahaba. That's the golden age of Islam. Khair al-Nas the best of people, best of generations is my nation. And then the nation that came after them, meaning their children, and then those who con con converted to Islam during that time. And then those that came after them, meaning their grandchildren, and those who converted to Islam during that time. He said, then there will come a time where there will be a people who will give false testimonies before they're even asked. And they will swear by their oaths. I swear by Allah. 
giving false testimony, meaning the Prophet وسلم, is speaking to people who don't value their word. That is not the Muslim. There will come a time where people will give testimony and swear by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be a straight lie. They don't have no honor with their word. The Prophet وسلم, could have just said that. But he speaks in a language that is so expansive and so broad that it can be interpreted and interpreted generation after generation depending on the time that you're living in. This is one of the miracles that the Prophet ﷺ was given. Jawami al-Kalim. The ability to say phrases that are so short but it's so broad in meaning. He said there will come a nation of people in my ummah. Tasbiku shahadatuhum yaminuhum. That they will bear witness to something. And they're not actually asked. And they will bear witness to things and swear, take an oath and swear. And the, the witness doesn't mean anything because it's a lie. Meaning they don't have any word. And it speaks to another narration where the Prophet ﷺ said, The first thing to be lifted from our ummah will be what? The first thing to be lifted from our ummah will be trustworthiness. How can a Muslim who prays five times a day, worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, iman, faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is part of the structure of his religion and his word is not trustworthy. And understand something, if a person's word is not trustworthy to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning you took your shahada, you took your shahada, right? And you don't fulfill your shahada with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you can't possibly fulfill your word when it comes to other people. Brothers, I'm just going to, the, the administrators of the masjids and you younger brothers, I do understand the whole pushaisti thing. But when you walk into a masjid, you have to remove that. That makes everyone in this room very uncomfortable, including myself. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking directly to you, brother. No, the, the young brother that just walked in. Yes. We, we've had situations in Masajid. And brothers, you have to make sure that we have security for our Masajid. We can't. I am the security. Excuse me? I am the security. I got you. But I'm uncomfortable. I don't know that. I don't know you. I can't see your face. And it makes me uncomfortable. No, I'm not telling you to go, brother. I'm saying take your mask off. That's what I'm saying. Take your mask off. You walk in with a hoodie on, with your mask on, with your hand holding your... Yes. But how do we know what you're holding? Brother, what are you talking about? I had checked them out before you came to Got you. But what I'm drawing your attention to is how something like that can happen, and we just had a shooting in the masjid. You understand? No. We cannot, that's not normal. Walking into a masjid with a hoodie on and a busha, a mask on your face, that is not normal on Jumu'ah. I'm trying to wake you brothers up out of this. Because it's only a matter of time. I, I keep telling you, you guys, oblivious. I keep telling you. It's only a matter of time. If that was a shooting at the Eid, it's only a matter of time before that happens inside the masjid. Mark my words. I'm not speaking that into fruition. I understand the elements that we're dealing with. That's unacceptable. And I'm saying this moving forward. When you walk into a masjid, you don't need a mask over your face walking into a masjid. You don't need a hoodie on with a mask on walking into a masjid. For me, it makes me uncomfortable. I'm, I'm not cool with that. We live in an environment where to say something like that means you're a coward or if you're scared, you don't come to the map. No, I'm scared. Absolutely. I'm not Malcolm X. I'm not going to sit here and be silent about something that I see that's standing in front of me. Malcolm saw the guy walking up towards him and he did nothing about it. I'm sorry. I'm not that person. If I fear, then you need to be in fear as well. This is not going to be that situation. Not on my watch. I can't speak for what happens other, other than that, but not on my watch. I'm sorry. If I'm going, you're going with me. I promise you that. Provided that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't take my soul first. 
nonetheless, that, brothers and sisters, that is not normal behavior. And we cannot normalize that type of behavior. Oh, he just has a mask on. Yes, out in the dunya, you're fine. You walk into the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we walk in dressed in our best. That's the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And this is exactly what the khutbah is about. بارك الله لي ولكم في القرآن العظيم ونفعني وإياكم بما جاء فيه من الآيات وذكر الحكيم أكل ما تسمعون استغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المؤمنين من كل دم فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم الحمد لله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه كما يحب ربنا ويرضى وصلى الله على النبي محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا شيخ يونا can you open the door just let some air in inshallah الله سبحانه وتعالى says in the Quran واعتصموا بحبل الله جميعا ولا تفرقوا all you who believe fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and hold on tight to the rope of Allah and don't become divided Hold on tight to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and do not become divided. Qatada, he said, Hablullahi al mateen alladhi amar Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and yu'tasamu bihi huwa al Quran. Qatada, he said, the habl, the rope of Allah that Allah commanded us to hold tightly to is the Quran. And another narration of Abdullah ibn Abbas, he said that the Hablullah al Mamdud, mean as sama il al ar. That the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the rope that extends from the heavens down to the earth. And that is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by default, the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So holding on to the Qur'an is not just having the Qur'an in your home, on your bookshelf, sitting on a, you know, sitting on a table, sitting on a shelf, just sitting there. Holding on to the Qur'an, brothers and sisters, is incorporating the Qur'an into your life. Aqidatin wa khulukin in your aqidah, in your belief, in your worldview, how you view the world, as well as in your character and how you carry yourself. When they went to the house of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha and they asked her, Kayfa khulukin Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? How is the character of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the home? We see how he's acting when he's out and about, but how does he act in the home? And Aisha, she said, Ala taqra'oon al Quran. Don't you read the Quran? His behavior is the Qur'an. Meaning any character that you find in the Qur'an, any behavior you find in the Qur'an, that was the behavior of the Prophet ﷺ. That is how you incorporate the Qur'an into your life. Not just sitting on a bookshelf in your house that you only pick up during Ramadan. Not sitting on a bookshelf or sitting on a shelf somewhere collecting dust. Incorporating the Qur'an into your life, brothers and sisters. That is the way we become people of Qur'an and Sunnah. And so, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said, "In Allah yarda lakum thalathan wa yasqatu lakum thalathan." Allah loves for you or is pleased with you for three things, and He hates for you three things. He said, "As for the things that He loves for you or He's pleased with for you, yarda lakum an taabduhu wa la tushriku bihi shay'an." He is pleased with you that you worship Him alone and you don't associate partners with Him. وَأَن تَعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا And he loves for you to hold tightly to the rope of Allah and not to be divided amongst yourselves. وَأَن تُنَاسِحُوا مَنْ وَاللَّهُ اللَّهُ أَمْرَكُمْ And that you give extend advice to those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed them uh, as authority figures over you. Number three, the, the second part of that, he said, And Allah hates for you. وَيَسْخَطُ لَكُمْ قِيلَ وَقَالَ وَكَثْرَةُ السُّؤَالِ وَإِضَاعَةِ الْمَالِ And he hates for you three things. And those three things are gossiping. Kila wa qal. He said, she said, guess what this one said, guess what this person said. That's hated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It causes division in the community. When you go to someone and say, guess what so and so said about you. I'm only telling you this because, no, they're only telling you that because they want to see conf conflict between you. Most of the time. Most of the time. That's not all the time. Sometimes a person may mean you well when they tell you that. But when a person comes to you gossiping about what somebody said, the first question you should have for them is, well, why did they feel comfortable telling you? Why did they feel comfortable saying that in front of you? If they said that about me, and you sat right there, and they know me and you were cool, how did they feel comfortable saying that in front of you? And why didn't you check them when, you said, when he said it? But you felt comfortable enough to come tell me that they said it? Nah, you're looking for fitna. You're looking for confusion. You're looking for division between two Muslims. It's haram. 
قيل وقال hates for you he said she said gossiping وكثرة السؤال and asking a lot of questions about the deen when you have no intention on following it how many people, Muslims, brothers, sisters, ask questions? Wallahi, I was in Medina. We used to see students run up to the Sheikh. Sheikh, what is this? Follow him all the way to his car, asking him questions all the way as he's getting into his car. Have no intention on following it. How do you know? Because many of those same students come back to America, not even practicing Muslims. Some of them not even Muslim in today's time. But you're the same one following the Sheikh to his car, asking him a thousand questions. Because you want to look studious. You want the look of being a student. But then you come back into the belly of the beast here and, you know, year after year go by, you're just watching your Islam dwindle little by little by little until there's nothing left. Many students. There were students at the time. <coughs> Wallahu a'lam whether they even Muslim in today's time. But this is, this is what we do. Asking questions about things you have no intention on following. When knowledge comes to you, brothers and sisters, you become responsible for practicing it. Imam Ahmed Rahimullah Ta'ala said that I never memorized the hadith except that I acted upon it, even if it was just one time, so that hadith would not be a proof against me on the day of judgment. Even one time. He said, I read a hadith that the Prophet got cupped, got cupping done, and he gave the person who cupped him a dinar, a silver coin. He said, So I went and got cupped, and I gave the person who cupped me a silver coin. Following the hadith of the Prophet. You you read it, you memorize it, you know it, why don't you practice it? يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لِمَا تَقُولُوا مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ كَبْرُ مَقْتًا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَنْ تَقُولُوا مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ O oh, you who believe, why is it that you say that which you do not do? Hate it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that you say what you don't do. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates for us gossiping. He hates for us كَثْرَةُ السُؤَالِ Asking questions about things excessively that we have no intention on practicing. And thirdly, إِضَاعَةِ mal, Wasting your money. Spending your money in things that are disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or just spending the money and you don't necessarily need to spend it. So understand, brothers and sisters, holding fast to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is Islam. That is our deen. In ending, when Imam Ahmed was put in prison, Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah ta'ala, was put in prison. Sadly enough, for an aqidah, for a belief that many of us boast to have, I'm on the Aqidah of Ahl Sunnah. We boast to have, but we don't practice. Imam Ahmed was tortured, beat, lashed, put in prison for Aqidah, for a belief, to make sure that the belief of Ahl Sunnah remained and endured. And he dealt with whatever he had to dealt with, deal with during that time. The leader of the Muslims during that time, his name was Mu'tasim. And he was trying to break Imam Ahmed. So he brought all of these, you know, pseudo scholars in. To debate with Imam Ahmed. And so he brought Imam Ahmed out in chains and he brought these scholars here and he said, Debate with Ahmed. And Imam Ahmed turned as they're asking him questions, he's not responding to any of them. He turns to Muratassim, the leader of the Muslims, and he says, They said, Ahmed, why are you not answering any of these scholars? Why are you not responding to them? Imam Ahmed turns to Mu'atassim, the leader of the Muslims, he said, bring me something from the book of Allah or from the sunnah of the Prophet and then I will respond. I don't debate what is just my opinion, the way I see, philosophize, the deen. I don't do that. Bring me something from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or something from the sunnah of the Prophet and then I'll answer. And so one of the faux scholars or pseudo scholars there, his name was Ibn Abi Du'ad. He's from the, the sect called the Jahmiyyah. They reject the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He turns to Imam Ahmed and he says, Wait, ya Ahmed. He said, Oh Ahmed, shame on you. He said, You don't have an intellect? You don't use your own intellect? He said, You only say or speak with the book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet. And Imam Ahmed said, Islam illa ala kitabullah. He said, Does not is the deen not built on anything else other than the deen of the book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet? Meaning the Sunnah of the Prophet, the book of Allah, the Sunnah of the Prophet, that is my life. I do not speak about matters that I have no knowledge of unless I go back to the book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet. 
I don't speak according to my own desires. I don't speak according to my own whims. I don't speak according to my own rationale or my own philosophizing of the deen. My speech is what Allah said, what his messenger said, how the Sahaba understood. That is the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That, brothers and sisters, is Salafiyya in a nutshell. Not following behind this scholar, not going over here to this masjid, not being with these brothers, not wearing your thobe hiked up here, not holding on to a beard here, not having a prostration mark here, but yet you're still involved in street activity. That's not Salafiyya. The book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the understanding of the Sahaba, and statement and action. And until we do that, don't say nothing about Salafiyyah. Don't say nothing about the minhaj of the Salaf. Don't say anything about what minhaj you on, what you follow. Man, miss me with all of that. Because it's all rubbish. It's all kalam. It's no reality to it. Wallah al amongst the multiple pop the multitude of populations of Muslims here in America, as African American Muslims, we are a laughing stock. Because we are the loudest when it comes to talking, but we are the most silent when it comes to building. We haven't built anything. We haven't established anything. The best we can offer is what I'm on, how I'm dressed, and how violent I can become with you when I don't like you or you say something that I don't like. We are a laughing stock. And my job, as well as many other imams, is to restore the honor. And the honor is only restored with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, nothing else. I don't care how tough you are, how violent you are, how tough, I don't care. None of that is going to restore honor. None of that gives you honor. Honor is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There is no honor beyond that. Brothers and sisters, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Stick closely to the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in statement and in action. In belief, in statement, in action. Let that be manifest in the way that you carry yourself. Let that be manifest in the way that you engage the world that is around you. That is the greatest way to give da'wah to anybody. It's by showing them what you are upon. Don't tell the person what you're upon. I'm upon this and I'm upon that and I go to this message and I listen to this imam. All of that means nothing. Show me through your actions. What did Aisha say? Don't you read the Quran? His character was the Quran. He's the Quran walking. It wasn't just mouth. He was the embodiment of everything that is in the Quran. Aqidatin wa khuruqin. He's an embodiment of the entire Quran. And that is our prophet, that is our messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa that is who we emulate, that is who we follow. So then we need to be upon the same thing. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his forgiveness. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise the status of the Muslims here in America and beyond. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to relieve the people of Palestine of this burden of this oppression that Israel is inflicting upon them, this genocide that they are inflicting upon them. Wallah ala brothers and sisters, you cannot go to sleep at night without making du'a for the people of Palestine. You can't. One scroll through Twitter, man, subhanAllah, the images is enough to give you pause. It's enough to make it difficult for you to sleep, to see this is going on. Protesting going all around the world and we out shopping and moving on with our day like nothing is happening. The Prophet said the believers are like one body. When one part aches, the other part is up at night with sleeplessness and fever. We feel it. Things cannot go back to normal after what we see happening to here, after we see what is happening here. And it only gets worse after this. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to return us to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma rudd al-Muslimin ila deenihim raddan jameela. Oh Allah, return the Muslims to their deen with a beautiful return. Allahumma rudd al-Shabaab al-Muslimin ila deenihim raddan jameela. Oh Allah, return our young Muslim men to the deen of Allah with a beautiful return. Allahumma gfir lana wa rahamna. Warfa'na. Oh Allah, forgive us and have mercy upon us and raise us, raise from amongst us those who will call to the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and they will not fear the blame of those who find fault or those who criticize. For indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has power over that, uh, over that and he has power over all things. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyya Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ataslimin kithira. Wa subhanaka rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa aqimu al
الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن 